old man along the way, hoping to find some old forgotten words or ancient melodies. He turned to me as if to say, hurry boy, it's waiting there for you. In Japan, the bright lights never stop burning. The nation has an insatiable need for energy, but virtually no natural resources to generate it. To meet demand here, they bet big on nuclear power. We blindly believe nuclear plants were completely safe, immune from accidents, and the cheapest source of energy. But the meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi changed everything. To avoid another Fukushima, we should close all nuclear plants. Like the rest of the world, Japan is at a crossroads. Can they get along without nuclear? Sure. The price is going to be very, very high for them. Wind and solar are not going to run the Ginza lights. How will we power the planet without wrecking the climate. If you really do wish to do something about climate change, a nuclear is the path. We don't use nuclear because we got freaked out in the 70s. There are some innovative ideas on the drawing boards. For my generation, we are much more concerned about climate change and global warming. We're not going to rule anything out because the issue is so important. But given its checkered past, how realistic is atomic power? Are we ready for the nuclear option? Ladies and gentlemen, Summit moderator Miles O'Brien of PBS. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon session. And um, thank you for, for being here. Uh, that was the, uh, the show open uh, to uh, a Nova film I did called The Nuclear Option. I invite you to find that online and check it out sometime. It uh, addresses some of the issues we're going to get into here. And um, not just Fukushima, but uh, the, the future of nuclear power and where it fits into the big picture. Uh, I have um, had the good fortune uh, to spend a lot of time in Japan, uh, several trips to Fukushima uh, over the past uh, few years, since 2011. And um, I went in with a lot of misconceptions. So I think some of the misconceptions that are uh, held by the general public, uh, that Fukushima is a poster child for the fact that nuclear energy isn't safe and can't be made safe. Uh, to the contrary, what you find out when you spend a little more time there and really dive in is, number one, that plant, which was uh, early generation two plant, uh, which is to say pretty old, uh, met its design basis criteria. It did what the engineers and its designers asked it to do. It survived the earthquake. The Black Swan event, the tsunami, which ultimately caused all the trouble, was never envisioned by the designers and was not a part of the design basis. Now, you could, maybe you could make an argument that they should have seen a giant tsunami coming, but they didn't. And the point is, it worked as it was designed. It worked as it was supposed to. It also became clear to me as I did stories on how to clean it up, that this is a great example of um, why it is important not to run away from nuclear power, but to constantly iterate and improve it. Uh, if we have a fleet of nuclear plants, there are you know, time capsules in the 1970s, and we have not iterated the, the technology to make improvements as we see uh, technological, technological solutions, and as we see problems, uh, we are making a huge mistake. So I think um, the, uh, the initial reaction that this is uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the final uh, nail in the coffin, whatever you want to say about nuclear, is just dead wrong. It's the exact opposite. It's the wrong lesson. So we're going to get into all of that in the coming hour and a half. But we have a very, very special guest who uh, is joining us as our headline speaker. He has a long history uh, at TEPCO, beginning in 1976. He uh, had the 
challenging, uh, well, to say the least, challenging job of guiding TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, through the uh, events subsequent to the uh, tsunami and meltdowns at Fukushima. Uh, a challenging job, to say the least. He's going to tell us a little bit about his le the lessons learned in that experience, uh, what it's like coming back from uh, an event like that. And then we want to get into the broader picture of, number one, what's going to happen in Japan, a, a nation that invested heavily in nuclear power, 54 reactors with uh, approximately 30% of their electrical generation capacity by those reactors with plans to go to 40%. Uh, all that pretty much being upended on uh, March 11th, uh, uh, 2011. So uh, there's a lot of questions that I'm sure we all have, and we will have a panel discussion. We'll be joined by Dale Klein, former NRC uh, commissioner at Lake Barrett, uh, the engineer who led the cleanup at uh, Three Mile Island, both of whom have been heavily instrumental in helping TEPCO come back from uh, Fukushima Daiichi. But first, we have the great honor of uh, hearing, uh, to call it a war story is probably an understatement. His experience dealing with this uh, offers us all kinds of insights into what it's like to manage in a crisis and post-crisis. So ladies and gentlemen, just in from a long flight from Tokyo, uh, please welcome, give a warm welcome to Naomi Hirose. Uh, thank you, Miles, for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Naomi Hirose. Uh, it is great pleasure to be here to speak to you this afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Uni Purdue University for providing me this opportunity today. Well, it has been eight and a half years since the accident of our Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. Uh, fortunately, um, the current front condition is stable, and the uh, situation of the surrounding communities are getting better day by day. Although the accident itself was very, very severe one, but uh, we have learned a lot from the accident. We have uh, experienced a lot since the accident. So it is my great pleasure to update uh, the situation of Fukushima and then also share some of the lessons learned from the accident with you today. Um, before I start, I just wondered how much you remember what happened eight and a half years ago. So let me begin with a brief explanation of what happened eight and, eight, eight and a half years ago. It was a <clears throat> Friday afternoon at 2.46, March 11, 2011, a very, very large earthquake hit Japan with a lecture scale magnitude 9.0. Uh, this one is the biggest, uh, still biggest uh, earthquake in Japan's recorded history, and then fourth largest in world recorded history. Epicenter is right in front of our nuclear power station, about 110 miles exactly east. <coughs> what happened at our nuclear power plant at the time of the earthquake was so-called scrum, inserting control rods between the nuclear fuels immediately after they felt the, the turbulence and stopped the nuclear fission. Stopping nuclear fission means stopping power generation. So power plant itself needed the power for itself. And then the power was supposed to come from outside through the power line, but unfortunately, one of our power pylons fell down because of the earthquake, and we didn't receive any power from outside. So immediately after that, um, self you know, turbine generator um, started producing power. So using that power, we control the power plant again. I was in the head headquarters, and the first report I received from the nuclear power plant was Scrum was successfully made, and we controlled the power plant. I still remember I was very much relieved with this first report, because as you know, that in Japan, we have a lot of big earthquakes. And we had experienced this uh, scrum situation before, so that I thought this one was one of those past events. But 15 minutes later, at 3.36, a devastating tsunami hit Japan's 
coastline. As you saw that, you know, the, the video of Miles, uh, you, you've probably seen that kind of video many times. You know, it's like a giant, gigantic uh, surfing wave. Unfortunately, nobody was taking video of tsunami hitting uh, to the nuclear power plant. I guess that they are busy, you know, taking care of the, the power plant after the earthquake. But one guy in our thermal power plant was taking video of tsunami hitting his thermal power plant. That thermal power plant is Hirono thermal power plant, it's just 12 miles south of Fukushima Daiichi. It's so close. So why don't we watch uh, the video of this? The video, you know, this is the Pacific Ocean, and this is uh, no, this is south. And again, this is not a nuclear power station. This is thermal power station. <coughs> The tsunami didn't come from directly from east. It came rather southeast. Again, this is not nuclear power plant, but uh, power generation it looks similar. So I hope that you have some kind of the images of the tsunami hitting power plants. Take a look at these automobiles. They look like fallen leaves. Okay, this goes on and on, so why don't we stop this? <clears throat> so this is a tsunami hitting the thermal power plant. And this is a map of the Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a uh, Pacific Ocean and unit one, two, three, four. This blue area is inundated with seawater. The tsunami washed away, um, you know, turbine generator, batteries, and electric boards, and then pumps, and everything. So we lost the power completely. We are totally blind. Station blackout situation. As you know that nuclear fuels keep enormous amount of heat even after the nuclear fission stopped. <clears throat> so we had to cool them down by recirculating uh, cooling water. But pump stopped, first of all, we lost the power, so we, we couldn't uh, cool them down anymore. The temperature of the nuclear fuel start, started going up, and then uranium rods are covered with metal called zircaloy. This material starts melting around the temperature of 1,500 degrees Celsius. So it started melting and formed enormous amount of hydrogen by the chemical reaction with water. And then hydrogen is lighter than the air, so it went up. And then nuclear power plant building do not have any windows, so it's, it's inside the building, accumulated on the top of the inside building. We still do not know what ignited the explosion. But um, obviously, there are many, many aftershocks. So electric bulbs might fall down, or pipe shaft might fall down. Anything could happen. So something ignited. And then uh, hydrogen explosion took place at unit one, three, and then four within three days, as you saw that the video of Miles. <coughs> and then radioactive material spread outside the power plant and plant site. This map shows that the radiation dosage level in the surrounding community. Take a look at the left-hand side. Obviously, th this is a power plant. Obviously, the wind came from north, uh, southeast to northwest, so that the contaminated area spread toward the northwest direction. Take a look at this right-hand side map. By the way, this is as of April 2011, so it's just one month after the accident. The right-hand side is as of November 2018, last year. So it's seven and a half years after the accident. So it looks much, much better because a lot of decontamination work had been done. And then as time goes by, as you know, the radiation level goes down naturally. 
So it looks much, much better now. This is the evacuation zone. Right after the accident, the government of Japan designated an evacuation zone within a radius 20 kilometers, 12 miles. So uh, somewhere in this area was the initial evacuation zone. But as you saw that the radiation level goes down, the evacuation zone is getting smaller. But still, this pink area uh, remain as an evacuation zone. The size of this area is 370 kilometers, about 3% of the uh, total area of the Fukushima prefecture. By the way, the size of the Fukushima prefecture is almost the same as the state of Connecticut. So you, you, may, you might have some kind of the images of the 3% of the state of Connecticut still <coughs> remains in the evacuation zone. <coughs> this is the number of people uh, are forced to evacuate. At the time of the accident, more than 160,000 people were forced to uh, leave home. But the, the number is still uh, going down, but still 24,000 people uh, who used to live in that pink area, uh, those people cannot go home even if they want to. So one of our responsibility uh, is restore and then recover the, the area, community, so that the people can go home if they want to. This is what happened eight and a half years ago and thereafter. Now, let me now t talk about the current situation of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. As I said, the plant condition is stable and then cooling water is being recycled 24-7. It's a very, very stable condition. <clears throat> we also improved a lot of uh, things in, uh, for the betterment of the working condition. Take a look at this red left-hand side map. This red area is a whole area of the Kushima Daiichi plant site. In every area, we have to wear this kind of bizarre protective gear, full face mask, Three pairs of gloves, two pairs of socks, and then, but now, 96% of the area is what we call green zone, where we do not have to wear any protective gear. So whenever you come to visit Fukushima Daiichi, which I'd like to welcome you, you don't have to wear any, any, any special things. You can come with your regular clothes now. And then... We, we also opened cafeteria for the worker, which serves hot meals, and then there is a convenience store. So the working condition in this plant site has been you know, improved very much. But still, I would say there are two, two major, very difficult challenges ahead of us. One is uh, removing spent fuels, and the other is removing fuel debris, molten fuels. Let me talk about spent fuel first. <clears throat> this is a, a cross-section view. Take a look at this, each of the upper, si upper right-hand side of the each uh, unit. This is, a, this is a spent fuel pool where the, a lot of nuclear fuel still remain in the pools. But take a look at this unit number four. Unit number four was not operation on March 11, 2011. It was in a periodical inspection. So the, all the nuclear fuels in the reactor had been removed to the spent fuel pool. That's why there were that, this many uh, spent fuels, fuels in the uh, spent fuel pools, 1,535 fuel bundles. And then as I said, that unit number four had a hydrogen explosion. So the top of the building is gone. So this spent fuel pool is, how you say, kind of open to the air. So if we had lost this cooling water, spent fuels could have been exposed to the air. So this one was, this was really, really big risk. So first, we tried to take these spent fuel first. And then took, it took one year, but uh, by the end of 2014, 
we took all the 1535 well bundles from unit number four. So as far as the unit number four is concerned, there is no radioactive materials in reactor nor spent fuel pool. So risk level is very, very low now. So now we are trying to uh, take um, this 566 fuel bundles from unit number three. Unit number three had also the explosion. So the top of the building is mess. So first we had to uh, take all the those rubble out and then build this kind of cylinder shape building on the top of the building. Inside, we put install the fuel handling machines and crane. And we just started removing spent fuels from unit number three. We have already taken 28 out of 566. Uh, so that's the same operation, but uh, compared to the uh, unit, number two, unit number four, the uh, dosage level here of the unit number three is a little higher. So I don't want my colleague get dosed. So this whole operation has to be done by remotely controlled way. So it's a little bit difficult and then takes time. So you, uh, we, th we think that it takes a year or a year and a half to take all the 566 fuel bundles from unit number three. But anyway, we are, we are in the process. Next is the fuel debris, molten fuel. Please take a look at these uh, cross-section views. <clears throat> uh, the condition of the, each unit, one, two, three, is different. For example, take a look at unit number three. The primary containment vessel of the unit number three is filled with water, cooling water. So the robot has to swim. So that we have, we, we develop this robot and we put the screw at the end so it swim and then go into this water and uh, explore the, the situation. For unit number two, the penetration uh, of the primary containment vessel is very narrow so that we had to develop this kind of the fishing rods, fishing line type robots. And the end of the fishing line, we put a video cam camera and then monitoring device. And then put it here. And then take a look at these things. I'll show you the video of that exploration, which was, uh, which was taking place January of last year, year and a half ago. Let me show you this. We are, first we are looking up, this is a bottom of the reactor. So we see the uh, control rods drive, uh, oops, oops, sorry. Oops, it doesn't move, okay. Uh, the water is falling down, this is the, this is the original uh, control rods drive. You know, water is keep falling down, but uh, looks, the water comes far left. So it seems that there is a hole through which that modern fuel fell down. This is the bottom of the containment vessel. This is, this is the thing which dropped from the reactor. It looks like lava. And then we keep falling, you know, pouring the cooling water. See? And then we did a second exploration for this. And then this time, we put uh, a robot with magic hand. This black thing is uh, the kind of finger of the boss, uh, finger of the magic hand. We try to grab the pebble type things and then try to lift up. See, we lift up. I think this is a great step forward. Now we know, now we know we can pick them up, those small pebble things. Now, although we didn't bring anything from the primary containment vessel out because we didn't prepare any container, anything. So we just pick up and then left it. But next time, within a year, we will take small portion of this out of the primary containment vessel. And then I check that the ingredients 
and then plan for the next uh, stage and plan for the uh, plan design for the containers or you know how to store the the, the things. Okay, this is a this is the current situation of the Kushima Daiichi. So it it is moving, although it's, it's the progress is very s slow, but uh, we are moving forward. Let me explain that the, our activities outside the power plant. <coughs> um, as I said, uh, one of our responsibility is restore the community, res recover the community so that people can go home if they want to. But uh, eight and a half years mean very much. Their houses are messed up, wild animals are running around, and they need it when, when they come home, to clean up their houses, and then snow shoveling in winter, and weeding in summer. Those, those things are definitely necessary for them to get back. Compensation money is not enough. In the past six, seven years, those things have been done by TEPCO employees on a voluntary basis. You know, they, the, our people, our colleagues are working in the Tokyo metropolitan area, uh, field offices and then um, you know, branch offices. And then they go to Fukushima and doing these activities and they see the impact of the accident and feel something. And sometimes they meet people evacuated and have kind of the very difficult conversation with them and then come back to their offices and then tell what they saw, what they felt, what kind of, kind of the conversation they had with the people to their colleagues. And then one other colleague says, okay, I'm gonna go to Fukushima next. This kind of the chain activities continues and then total number of the person they spent in Fukushima doing these activities have reached over 400 70,000 person days. I know this is very, very Japanese way of taking responsibility, but the, these activities are very much appreciated by local people, local government, local mayors, and then I'm very, very proud of them doing these things on a, on a voluntary basis. Of course, I asked their help, but I didn't push them, but I, I'm very proud of them. Let me, let me, explain some of the lessons we learned from the accident. We have learned a lot, but I listed here three things. Instilling safety culture, and then importance of the better communication, and then solidarity. Let me talk about safety culture first. <coughs> I'm, I keep telling to my colleagues that since we had that big accident, We've got to learn a lot about safety, right? And then we've been doing many things to instill the safety culture in our, in our organization. But it's not easy, of course. Probably it will never be completed. We are always in the middle of the long journey. But still, still very difficult. I Recently, I think that uh, the reason why it's so difficult is there is a very, very strong um, obstacles and constraints against safety, which is cost and time. Uh, people uh, tend to think that uh, safety and meeting budget, meeting schedule do not stand together. People tend to think these things are mutually exclusive. People think, tend to think they are the kind of the trade-off situation, either take safety or cost, or take safety or speed. But I would say, as far as they think uh, that way, no matter how many times we repeat safety first, safety first in the morning meeting, I would say they would choose, they would prioritize cost or speed over safety at the end. I would say this is rather simple 
the reason why they, they, they prioritize uh, not safety. It's rather simple because the, even if you violate safety rules, the accident wouldn't necessarily happen, right? If you cross the street on red light, you necessarily hit by a car, right? So, but uh, if you exceed budget, or if you can't complete your job by the end of the certain date, it's obvious, and then your boss wouldn't be very happy, right? So people, at the end, prioritize cost or speed over safety. So what I'm asking them um, now is it's kind of religion. Believe in there is an optimal way, which is safer, which is cheaper, which is quicker. You know, this is not, there is no trade-off situation. They both stand together. Believe there is an optimal way which, which you know, stand together. So search, make every effort, effort to search for that optimality. This is what, what I'm telling to my people, which is not easy, of course. Let me give you one example. <clears throat> Suppose your job is digging a hole and then put some equipment in it and then cover it and then pave it. Okay. You start digging a hole at 9 o'clock in the morning and you finish the digging hole, a hole is completed, and then you put some equipment in it, and then start covering it. But it's getting dark. So you have to stop today's operation. But you can't leave the hole wide open. So you, you put temporal cover on it, and then you ask for the guard man to stay overnight, and you put them on the both side of the, the, the hole, and then next morning, you start your job and then complete. You see this kind of situation all over, right? It's a very, very typical example. But what if you start digging a hole at 6 o'clock in the morning? You might have finished everything before it gets dark. You didn't have to worry about the hole wide open. You didn't have to hire Godman for extra time, and then besides, you complete your job one day before. So this is, this is maybe too, too simple example, but I, I'm asking to my people, to my colleagues, think about it. There is some better way which is safer and cheaper and then quicker. That's why I'm asking now. The second thing is, uh, effective communication, particularly communication with mass media. We have made, in the past eight years, we have made serious stupid mistakes. Again, stupid same mistakes again and again and again. Every time we, our disclosure of something bad delayed. And every time mass media accused us by saying TEPCO tried to hide something again. I just wondered how, why we make so many same mistakes again and again and again. And I come up with uh, those people, in, particularly in the field, technical people, try to find out what the real cause was, what the countermeasure is not to happen again before they disclose. This is again very, very natural phenomena because at the, they know once they disclose something bad, they know they will ask what the real cause is, what, what, what the countermeasure is. So, so they would like to prepare the answer when they disclose, which is very understandable. But, uh, you, okay, Suppose that uh, something bad had happened at 4 o'clock, and then you disclose that at 4.30, okay, 30 minutes after the something bad happened. You could say, 
even if, when you ask what the real cause is, you can, you can say, we still do not know yet. We are working on it, right? Because it's just 30 minutes after some, something bad happened. But if you disclose something happened at 4 o'clock next morning, it's really difficult to say we, we still do not know. Media would, would ask you, what do you have been doing for the past 20 hours or so? So it's, it's, it's easier for them to, to say, we do not know yet, if they disclose as early as possible. So I'm telling to my people, anyway, don't, don't be afraid to, by saying that uh, I, we do not know. So in order to say so, better disclose as early as possible. And then besides, if you disclose something bad at 4.30, and then you, in the next morning, the media will ask the same question. And then you still do not know the answer. But still, you can say, we're still working on it. We still do not know next morning. And then for some reason, media wouldn't be very much, you know, you know this, how to say, strong to accuse. When, because you have already disclosed something bad the night before. So, it's, so we can save some time if you disclose the things immediately. Okay. This is a lesson. This is a very important lesson we learned from the accident. The third thing is building solidarity. At the time of the accident, uh, eight and a half years ago, the number of employees of TEPCO was something like 40,000. Among them, less than 4,000 people belonged to nuclear related sections. So it means that the best of the 90% of the people had nothing to do with nuclear. Their job is climbing up the electric pole and fixing wire cables and then calculate the electric types, those things. But it's kind of natural, it's kind of inevitable for those 90% of people to think, how come my salary was cut? This is a nuclear accident. I had nothing to do with nuclear. Why my salary was cut? Right? It's, it's, it's a very natural repercussion. But uh, as I said, that uh, people were evacuated needed weeding cleaning up their houses, and snow shoveling in winter. These activities can't be done by 10% of the people. So we, this is a very, very tough situation, extremely difficult situation. So we've got to cope with you know, gathering the, all the power of our employees. So I think this accident as, uh, as, as, as your own problem or as your, as, as your own uh, issue. This is, this is very much needed. So as, an, as, as CEO of, of this company, uh, this is a one thing that I strongly, mostly I you know, put my efforts on it to keep that, uh, um, sense of responsibility of, the, of, of everybody of, in, the, in our company and get together and feel, have a sense of the togetherness. These things are very important. So what I did <coughs> was, uh, although the, the CEO of TEPCO was very busy, but uh, even, if I have, even if it's very short time, if I have a spare time, I, visit, I visited field offices, branch offices, thermal power station, and then had tried to have a direct eye to eye, face to face com com a conversation with them. And then every time I explained the situation of the a company, uh, I rather talked about real situation. I didn't talk about rosy, bright future of TEPCO. I, I, I know that the hope is very, very important, but uh, fake hope is very, very vulnerable. Maybe they could be cheer up maybe one, two days, but once they know this is, this is, this is fake or this is not, this is false, 
you know, they, they would be very much disappointed. So I would rather told, I, I, I would, I'd rather told a true story. But the end of the story, I always added, we can do it. We can do this. And then I don't know how much this works, but I would say that uh, our people keep very, very high sense of responsibility still after eight and a half years. And then uh, we have, although the challenges are very, very difficult, uh, but uh, we, are, we got together and then we are um, coping with uh, these difficult challenges. So take a look at this, t t take a look at us and then please keep the, the interest in uh, Fukushima accident for a longer time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Hirose san Appreciate that. Why don't you okay. make yourself comfortable and okay. invite our other panelists up. And there is another Fukushima story, which mm -hmm. you alluded to briefly, which is the Fukushima Daini plant, about uh, 10 or 12 kilometers. Go ahead and make okay. yourself comfortable. 10 or 12 kilometers uh, to the south of Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, Fukushima Daini, uh, come on board, guys, had a very close call, but managed to survive. But its story is an interesting one in its own right. Uh, the man who was leading that plant at the time, now Hiro Masuda, uh, had uh, tremendous knowledge and experience there, was at that plant as they actually built it and knew it inside out <clears throat> and was able, with a little bit of luck and uh, a lot of actual uh, manpower, physical manpower and some, a lot of cable, uh, to avoid venting uh, radioactive material into the air by only about two hours. It's two hours away from a venting situation. Let's take a look at that uh, scenario briefly. Uh, this is an electrical cubicle uh, uh, to the uh, one pump. And precede, uh, there are a lot of sand, there are a lot of seaweed inside of this. Nahiro Masuda was the Fukushima Daini plant manager on that fateful day. He took me to an electrical equipment room that was inundated. You can see the print of of that, uh, that base. P please imagine uh, the water is inundated like this height. The high water flooded these electrical controllers that provide power to motors that run seawater pumps there to keep the nuclear cores cool. Okay. Usually we use those cubicles to supply that uh, electricity to the motors. So the but failure was in yeah, there? Yeah, failure is there. So we have, even we have a oxide power, but we cannot distribute those uh, electrical electricity to the motor. Then we decided to bring the cable from the other side, mountainside electrical cubicle to here. Then those are the cables we are pulling down. From dawn till midnight on March 13th, two days after the earthquake, 200 workers furiously laid down more than five and a half miles of cables to connect the pumps to the only power source that survived the tsunami. Now, fortunately, our clean function is coming back just before two hours to venting from the PCB. They finished just two hours before having to vent radioactive gas from the pressure containment vessel of the reactor into the atmosphere. It was a very close call. All right, here's our panel now to talk about close calls and other things. Uh, we have Dale Klein, who is joining, joining uh, Masuda-san. Uh, he is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Texas, uh, former Nuclear Regulatory Chairman uh, from 2006 to 2009, and he's Chairman of TEPCO's Nuclear Reform Monitoring Committee. Lake Barrett, who is a nuclear engineer and consultant, former head of the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management, oversaw the cleanup of uh, Three Mile Island in 1979 and has been consulting with Dale and um, uh, TEPCO for ever since the, the event in 2011. So first off, what, what's your take on why Daini survived and Daiichi did not? Uh, Lake, why don't you start with that one? Well, the damage was, was much worse at Daiichi because the batteries were flooded with salt water and they had no indication at all as to what the situation was inside. Daini, the batteries were higher, it was a newer plant, uh, and they had indication, but they had heroic efforts to, to bring the power, uh, to bring the cooling on board on, on Daini, as you saw in the video. Daiichi, they did not have that opportunity to do it. They 
They strung, they had teams of people pulling cables, but they couldn't do it in time because they were delayed by not having any indications. So more damage, and of course, in the case of 90, there was one power supply, but some of it, uh, Dale, has to do with, uh, I think, the unique brand of leadership that uh, uh, Masudasan brought to the table, right? Absolutely, Masudasan was a hero. Uh, he brought four units to safe cold shutdown. He knew the plant. He had a leadership style uh, like Hirose Sun, uh, hardworking, uh, trust factor. Uh, but the fact that uh, they did have an offsite power supply and the batteries, uh, he would have had a difficult time saving 1F. Uh, I asked him that question could he have saved 1F uh, like he did 2F? And he said it would have been very, very difficult. So a lot of things lined up for Daini and against Daiichi. Uh, Hirose san, uh, how much of it do you think, um, well, do you kind of shudder? at the thought that you're only two hours away from venting there. That, that just would have compounded the, 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 the whole accident in numerous ways, wouldn't it? Because yeah. uh, we are in a panic for the Daiichi. You know, we had the explosion already. And then we didn't have any time and any residual uh, power resources to take care of Fukushima Daini at all. We, are, we just concentrated on how to deal with Fukushima Daiichi. So the, the Masuda-san's effort and then the, the, all the people in Fukushima Daini, their efforts, are, it's, a, it's a tremendous uh, work. And then the big thing is um, there are four units in Fukushima Daini. All of them are on operation. On the other hand, Although that the accident we had in Fukushima Daiichi, there are six units. Only three are in operation. One, uh, four, four, five, six are in periodical inspection. So it's a, it's a really difficult situation. Although that the power, uh, one power and then one AC battery uh, survived uh, for Daini is, is a key, very, very important key because it uh, in the most difficult part in Fukushima Daiichi is we are totally blind. So we didn't know what's going on, where, what was the worst part, and which, which we should you know, concentrate. We didn't know anything. So we just, uh, we just do this, this kind of things in Fukushima Daiichi. On the other hand, Fukushima Daiichi knows they can monitor, they can check the gauge and everything so that they know that the condition you know, in a timely manner, manner so that they can concentrate a very important part. Like, uh, just a couple of words on um, the management philosophy of nuclear plants in Japan. Uh, the, the, the plant manager uh, at a plant in the United States, my understanding is when there's a crisis happening, they pretty much are God. They can do whatever they want and, and just, they don't have to ask for permission to do things. Uh, was that different in Japan at the time, and is there a lesson that has been learned out of that? There is a lesson. Uh, we, at Three Mile Island, uh, we went and made a lot of changes in this because we had a terrible lesson there, and, and we learned a lot from that. So more authority was given to the, to the plant to, to make the decisions. The Japanese culture is a little different. It's more hierarchical of, than we have in America. It's more collegial decision making. So um, it was, they'd made streamlining as well, but it, not to the degree that, that, that we had. So it took them a little more time, but their challenge was so much greater because of the devastation that they had from the, from the tsunami. So it, it challenged their system much more. They did heroic things at both plants, Daini and Daiichi, uh, to, you know, to cope with the situation, but it was just too much at Daiichi and they couldn't get the cooling water in. Dale, have there been some changes in the way manage, the, the marching orders for plant managers uh, subsequent? Has that been part of your recommendations? It, it absolutely has. I, I think one of the strengths of uh, the Japanese culture is also their weakness. Uh, it is very hierarchical, and so we did a survey, and we asked several of the workers that if your boss tells you to do something and you know it's wrong, what do you do? And too many people said, you follow what the boss says. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, but on the other hand, if you look at what Japan has done in manufacturing, uh, they have a culture in manufacture of high quality. So any worker can stop that manufacturing plant if there is a manufacturing defect. 
TEPCO and all the nuclear plants in Japan can do the same thing. If anyone sees a safety issue, they have the ability and the resources to stop the issue. So there is a cultural change going on, but it is slower than one would like. I'm sure Hirose-san would like it to go faster. But you have to do it the Japanese way. You know, we can't come in from the outside and say you have to behave in a certain way. And, but that process is occurring, and, and they understand it. It seems, uh, Hirose-san, to be a bit of a contradiction. You have a very hierarchical system, mm -hmm. people saying, I'll do whatever the boss tells me. And yet at the Toyota plant, all they do have to do is push a button, and it stops the assembly line. It, is, can, can the Toyota assembly line idea be, you know, put into the processes at a nuclear power plant. Is that the idea? Yes. Um, as I said, that, uh, you know, Toyota's, um, you know, quality control is it's a fabulous. It's a super good. But they, they think, they believe that, the, for example, safety or quality and then time and then cost, you know, stand together. That's what they philosophy. But that, as I told yeah. it's it's really difficult to 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 believe in so we are now introducing their philosophy and that that's why i'm trying to spread that religion to my uh, to my people all right let's move on and talk about the cleanup challenge um and you know, right at the top of the list are all those tanks uh, i think there are about a thousand of them now e it's like about a million tons of contaminated water. Uh, and the rub is, uh, they, they've had to reprocess some of the water, but the, the basic rub is, no matter how many processes you put it through, it still has tritium inside it. Tritium being uh, a cousin of hydrogen, next to impossible, I think, really, practical, as a practical matter, impossible to remove it from water. And so now the, the question is, how long do you keep filling these tanks as the groundwater penetrates uh, into the plant area? And at what point do you begin a, a process of steadily discharging into the ocean? So, where, for, uh, Dale, where do we stand on, the, on that request right now? When, whenever that this is mentioned, the, the fishermen of Fukushima are insistent that this, this cannot happen. What I see is uh, a growing risk there of concentrating a lot of material in one place that would be an earthquake risk. What, how, how, how are you going to sort your way through that one? You know, this, this is a challenge, and uh, Lake can talk about some of the impacts. Uh, we had the same issue with Three Mile Island, and how do you deal with that issue? A lot of it has to do with education and communication. Um, I think TEPCO is doing much better on their communication than they have in, in the past, but they still provide data and not information. Uh, and so I think we still need to work with that. They need to educate people. Uh, so if you, if you stop the person on the street, even in the U.S., and you say, what do you think about tritium? They're going to say, well, what's tritium? So, right. so a lot of people don't know what tritium is. N number two is they don't realize that tritium does not accumulate in the body, has a short half-life. So they have to really educate the public so they can make an informed decision. So if you ask the fishermen or anyone else, do you want to dump tritiated water in, in the ocean, the answer is going to be no. So you have to look at alternatives. And at the end of the day, a controlled, safe release is much better than an uncontrolled release. So they need to get a plan. They need to do it the Japanese way to communicate it and then move forward. But because if they don't, they run the risk of having an uncontrolled release rather than a safe, controlled release. I, you know, I think people there, uh, people, maybe people everywhere want zero. There's no such thing as zero radiation, if you know anything about that, of course. Uh, Lake, how does this relate to what happened at TMI? Because you also had treaty aid water there. Yes, we did. It, uh, socially, it's a social problem, okay? And we had exactly the same social problem at Three Mile Island. Um, now, for the 14 years to decontaminate and decommission the plant and to clean the plant up, we recycled the water all the time, but the treaty aid water was still there. So at the very end, after the, the fuel debris was all moved, the molten core and, and everything was cleaned up, uh, we were left with 9,000 tons of treated water. And the, this, our water was, was not heavy salted water like the million tons there. Uh, so we were able to evaporate it into the atmosphere because we had a social problem. The cities of Lancaster and York, downstream in the Susquehanna River, drank the water. And the mayors just said, you can't do this. We know it's perfectly safe, okay, and we know it's not going to be a problem, but we just can't. In a democracy, we just couldn't do it. So it was evaporated, and it basically uh, was put into the atmosphere. Okay. And, and, and now this water at, at uh, Fukushima, a million tons of high salt water, that is really not going to be practical. 
It, but the, the, the other thing that, that was interesting, both the three mile on and in Japan, so hypothetically, if you evaporate the water in Japan, it's going to go up, it's going to drift out, and it's going to fall in the ocean anyway. Right. So right. at the end of the day, the question it's is... It's really a slow release, isn't yeah. it, into the ocean. Uh, Naomi, what, what is the current situation? I, I realize every time you try to bring this up, uh, the, the, the fishermen, there's all this local opposition. The fishermen are saying, well, we can finally sell our fish a little bit. Don't do this to us. How do you get around that, especially in, in the consensus culture of Japan? Yes, um, still the, the government um, has um, um, gathered the, the experts and then have a discussion, uh, established at the committee where the, the, all the experts are discussing how to do it. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, we need some authority, some maybe government, uh, just declare we take care of this, or we, 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 we take all the responsibility of this, something like that. Fishermen, on the other hand, uh, they are very much willing to have, our dis have discussion with us so many times. So they know, they learn, their literacy of the tritium or radioactivity is very, very high now compared to the people in Tokyo. So they know how harmful or harmless tritium is now. But what they are very much afraid of is people in Tokyo do not know anything about <laughs> radioactivity or tritium. So that uh, uh, once it's diluted into the ocean, um, Tokyo people wouldn't buy fish from there. So that's what they are very much scared. So as Lake puts it, it's not a scientific issue, it's not really an engineering no, no, no. issue. Again, it's a social issue. Yeah, it's, it's social or marketing issue. So uh, lower left of this screen uh, is a, a graphic which depicts what's called the ice wall. It's a little bit of a misnomer. The idea was to freeze the soil all around the stricken plants to limit the um, encroachment of groundwater. Um, has it worked? It, it, is, it is working. Uh, at the end of the day, you don't want to stop all the water because if you do, then some of the highly radioactive water inside would drift out. Mm -hmm. So you do want some inflow, but, but the ice wall uh, is working. It's very expensive, and they might have been able to do it by pumps instead of by an ice wall, but that was a policy decision. But the ice wall is reducing the inflow. Yeah, before it completed, we have 400, 500, 100 tons of the uh, you know, groundwater inflow into the power plant buildings. But now it's 110, 20, something like that. So it's, it's, it worked. Although it can't stop, as, as Dale said, because it rains yeah. inside. Once it's, we had the complete wall, if rain falls, it stayed there. Yeah, so, well, so reduced amount, but not, not impermeable. No, no, no. Uh, and I, as you pointed out to me some time ago, Lake, uh, that, that the idea of this ice wall was announced right about the time that the Japanese were bidding for the Olympics. So if nothing else, it was probably <laughs> for Japan, from Japan's perspective, to build it for that reason alone. Huh? Yeah, um, the, the Olympics is a very important thing to Japan. And historically, in 64, when the Olympics were there at the end, it was sort of the post-World War II coming out party for Japan. So it's really important for psychologically for the country. They felt good, they were, they were a part of the modern world. The, the, in the last 20 years, things have been slow as far as economic growth compared to in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So they're looking to a rejuvenation with the 20 Olympics. So this has become a very important thing. And when the, some of the European countries are trying to say, it's not safe for Japan, we want to take it to a European country, um, the Japanese felt, you know, we really need to show, to right. show that this is under control, and they did. All right, let's go to the next slide very quickly. I, I think uh, Hiroshi-san covered the cleanup pretty well, but I, I do want to ask you one, j just kind of a time frame question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, last time I looked into it, it looked like it was going to be about a 40-year job. Is that, first of all, what the thinking is? And secondly, to what extent um, has TEPCO... Um, had to tap on all kinds of new expertise because, it, after all, you're all about generating electricity, not necessarily cleaning up nuclear power plants. That's a pretty unusual job. I think he's the, uh, one of the few guys who's had that job. So uh, to what extent is, uh, why don't you start with this one, Dale? To what extent is TEPCO doing the job right and we will get it done and deliver on the promise to clean it up in 
four decades. I think uh, TEPCO in Japan is doing it the right way. They're doing it slowly, logically, and while they would like to have a time, they, they, you always need a target. But as Hirose-san indicated, their culture is changing is to do it right, do it safe, not necessarily fast. They will have to develop a lot of new technologies. This is the first time we've had to go in and remove the molten rubble uh, that, has leave, that has left the uh, reactor vessel. So they need to develop new tools, new robots, new technology. Uh, but I think as we move forward, an example I like is on Unit 4, when they were removing the spent fuel, after they removed the first load, they stopped, they talked to the people and said what worked well, what should we do better to make it safer, more efficient, and that's what you want to see from a safety culture. You want to see learning, safe operation as opposed to meeting a schedule. All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about regulation and restarts in Japan. Uh, 54 reactors in Japan. Uh, at the time of 311, uh, it was about 30% of the electrical power grid. Uh, they had big plans to increase to up to 40%. Uh, now the thinking is uh, hit for about 20% by 2030. Uh, but there's only nine reactors operating right now. It's, it's been very slow getting the, the reactors up and running. Daini, the, the, the plant we just told you about, is going to be decommissioned. Uh, and um, the largest uh, nuclear power plant uh, right there, Kashiwazaki Karawa, uh, is uh, facing all kinds of uh, regulatory uh, obstacles. Uh, to rebuild. So um, what's, what's the outlook at this point? Um, I'll start with you, Hirose-san. Is, is the, um, the public opposition so strong and that the provincial opposition in the case of KK, I know the governor for a very long time did not want that plant reopened. Uh, is, it, is it something you can work through or do you think that this, this is sort of the beginning of the end of the era of nuclear power in Japan? Well. I would say that uh, um, in order to get uh, public acceptance from, particularly from local people, I think although it takes time, we we can we can have ultimately because it, uh, we we explain what's going on in the plants almost every day, and then try try to try. Hope they, they 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 feel that this is our plant. This is not just Tepco's plant. This is our town's. This is our plant. That kind of you know feeling is very important. So I, we we've been doing this. So hopefully, I think they can understand. But the, the problem is, I would say the biggest problem is uh, uh, unpredictability, unpredictable situation for the management side. You know, the, although the, the after the accident. Our new, newly introduced safety standard is very, very stringent, which is, which is understandable, and which it's got to, we got to have a very, very stringent uh, standard. But the problem is, is uh, they are counting the time. Uh, they have the limit of the lifetime, 40 years. And then we, can, we could extend only once to 60 years. But the, they count the time using the clock time. While we are stopping, we, we've been stopping nuclear power station for six, seven, eight, eight years. But it's been included. It's still time is running. The, the meter is running, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. from the management side, oh, you know, because it, it's so you know, stringent standard, it takes time to meet with that standard, <clears> or it costs a lot of time, money, time. And then we could. We could invest that much money if they, the plant continues to operate and then generate a lot of electricity. It makes sense. But we do not know how, how, how much that the residual time, you know. So from the management side, it's really difficult. So that's why there, we had 54 nuclear units at the time of the accident. And already 21 units have been abandoned. Nuclear operators have gave, given up, restart 21 units out of 54. So this is, this is why that the, from the management viewpoint, it's really <laughs> difficult to invest 
a lot of money on time. Well, and, and there you see me walking with uh, one of your employees there at Kashibazaki Karawa. Yeah. Beside the giant tsunami wall, which they yes. built there, uh, yeah. just part of a whole host of responses to what happened on mm -hmm. 311 mm -hmm. uh, to make it uh, able to withstand such yes. an event, even though a tsunami of that size would be highly unlikely on the west side of Japan. That, regardless, has not been enough. But, I mean, Lake, in your assessment, is that KK plant, the plant as safe as any plant could ever be? That plant is a very low-risk plant. It's a very safe plant. Yeah. Yes. But I, it, it still faces that opposition. Let's say this, take a, a moment to talk about the opposition and the public perception. Uh, you know, it's worth reminding you yeah, that the tsunami itself killed 19,000 people. The nuclear meltdown killed zero people. Uh, it get, these things get conflated in people's minds. To what extent is, uh, is the public perception in Japan still as strongly anti-nuclear as it was. I think the numbers were 70, 80 percent anti-nuclear immediately after the accident. Is that changing at all over time? I, I think it is changing um, slowly. I think in Japan, it's much like it is the United States. People really don't understand where electricity comes from. If you ask in the United States, where does electricity come from? Most of the people will tell you from the wall. <laughs> and, and so they don't understand what it takes to get electricity. So in Japan, if you talk to the average person and said, well, do you want a nuclear plant? The answer is going to be no. Do you want a coal plant? No. Do you want electricity? Yes. So I, I think in Japan, uh, they are in a unique position for two reasons. One is their energy security is different. Uh, you know, they have, as we say, there's four reasons that Japan will go nuclear. No oil, no coal, no gas, no choice. So as, as you look at, as Japan as a country, with their heavy manufacturing, they cannot do it with wind and solar alone. They're going to have to have some kind of base load electricity. Then the other impact is they are an island. So to them, climate change and rising sea levels have a significant impact. So they have a fairly strong, they had a strong um, uh, CO2 policy that sort of went away after the uh, Fukushima accident when all the nuclear plants were shut down. So the, their CO2 emissions rapidly went up. So they need to strike their balance between national energy security and climate change. Let's look at the picture here for just a moment on, on where it stands right now. Um, that, that graphic there is a bit of an eye chart, but basically what it you know, shows you, of course, is that nuclear went way down and basically coal and natural gas have uh, gone way up. Uh, the capacity for solar and um, wind is very small still in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some, for example, I, uh, Naomi, you were telling me that um, the, the wind on land is very limited. Yep. And of course, they don't have the, the advantages of our great continental shelf here. So offshore wind is problematic as well because it gets so deep so quickly. So yep. they're actually looking at building um, floating wind yeah. turbines. Yeah. Tell us, and, and TEPCO is actually involved in some of this. Tell us a little yes. bit about that. Yes. Uh, as, as, as you said, that uh, our um, coastline is so, sh sh you know, sharply uh, you know, get deep, steep. Precipitous so, is the yes, word, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, um, you know, floating uh, offshore wind is, uh, is a challenge. And then we have been uh, doing a lot of research and development, and we are, we are about to start doing that. But still, a lot of difficult things going on. Because it, uh, the, it's, it's, once it some, has some trouble, it's really difficult to fix it because it's floating. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the boat can't uh, yeah. reach that it, it, because it's, you know, typhoon is coming. Yes, it's one of those, what could go wrong with that idea, yes. right? So, you know? so, yeah, still, 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 it's very, very, uh, you know, challenging techni technology. So we will do that, but uh, we, we wondered how, how, how much is feasible or how much is possible. And, and there is, there's a lot of detail we can get in on feed-in tariffs and everything else, which yes. have limited the amount of solar. Uh, I mean, the, the, I think the top line statement is that generally Japan invested heavily in nuclear and didn't spend a lot of time thinking about other renewables. Is that accurate to say, Dale? Well, I think at the time uh, they were like other countries, um, probably a little bit more so because of their 
location, their cloud covers, and things of that nature. There have been a lot of breakthroughs in solar technology with thin films that makes them more economical. But at the end of the day, you still need electricity when the sun isn't shining and when wind's not blowing. And therefore, Japan being heavily into manufacturing will have to have some kind of base load electricity. Yes. Um, Lake, do, were there missteps along the way as far as investments in renewables uh, in Japan? And is there some regret about that at this point? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they have invested heavily in solar today and, and some of the wind as well and experimental uh, windmills. So uh, they had basically invested heavily in nuclear was where, where they felt and that was fine until this happened. Um, now they're catching up on some of the renewables, but it's still a, not going to carry the load that they need. It's hard to solve the, uh, the problem of uh, climate change, particularly in Japan, without nuclear. I mean, it really does focus uh, the decision making and limits your ca capability. Re you really don't have a practical renewable uh, alternative. It would take many, many, many years to do that. When you have, a, and you have a fleet of, well, 20 of them are now offline, but whatever, 30 some odd reactors that could be turned on, that, that's a national asset that's kind of withering, isn't it, uh, Naomi? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I as you mentioned about national security, Japan's energy self-sufficient ratio is only 10 to 11 percent, which is uh, second to the last among 34, 36 OECD nations. By the way, that the last one, the least self-sufficient country in OECD nations is Luxembourg. Really? Yeah, Luxembourg right. is a part of continent, uh -huh. a part of the power grid line. A part, part of the pipeline. But Japan is an island, so our, our grid stands alone, so it's, it's a completely dif you know, different situation. So the 10, 11% of the self-sufficiency is, is very, very strategically dangerous, I'd say. Now, it's, not, it's a matter of the national security. It's not, this is a totally different aspect from the United States. All right, question. Good afternoon. I'm John Stevens from Argonne National Laboratory, and I'd, I'd like to start by thanking you for really extraordinary communication, the, the clarity of your message, which I know is so difficult, uh, and, and the lessons learned that you presented are, are really deeply appreciated. The prior session was about nuclear as clean energy, and one of the questions that came up from the audience was about nuclear liability and what do we do about the fact that we have had uh, several uh, major events. Um, you know, fortunately, Three Mile Island didn't actually release uh, to the, the public. Chernobyl was a class of its own. Uh, we're thankful we have containment in the Western world. But then we did face the challenge at Fukushima. Uh, one of the great honors of my life was to get to know the people at Kendai University who were working on the agricultural restoration mm -hmm. in Fukushima mm -hmm. and restoring confidence in the products by deploying uh, radioactive detectors to grocery stores mm -hmm. throughout Japan and all. Can you comment on, uh, the, the, another thing you presented that was great was, you know, 470,000 uh, days of, of volunteer effort is almost inconceivable as a, a human response. Um, but can you talk about beyond TEPCO, how the nation has responded and what that might mean for us talking about nuclear as a clean energy source for the future? Well, um, it's been eight and a half years. So, I mean, this is a good side, maybe bad side. People, are, people start forgetting the accident in Japan. Um, so, in terms of, in terms of the uh, Fukushima products, agriculture pro products, um, Maybe the first several years, people are very much about, very nervous about the Fukushima food because of the radioactivity. But um, forgetting about the accident is a good thing for that aspect. But on the other hand, um, as you know, that we have a flood, uh, earthquakes, and then you know, blackout, and many, 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 many things are happening. In, in, in the past eight years after the, after the Fukushima accident. So, so it's kind of understandable that people, even I 
sometimes mistake this accident was before the, that earthquake or that, that flood or something like that. But, but anyway, um, people gradually uh, do not afraid of the Fukushima food very much. So, so it's, it's good, it's good. And then, but on the other hand, um, for the Fukushima people, their feeling is very much mixed. They, they, they do not want to be forget, you know, they do not want people forget about Fukushima on my hand. But then the, that side, as, as Lake said, that uh, uh, Tokyo Olympics is, uh, is called in Japan, or the revitalization uh, Olympics. Uh, so the, the torch runner start from Fukushima st Stadium. So uh, people, um, you know, take this Olympics as a restart of the Fukushima things. So, so it's kind of a mixture, a good side, a bad side. Another question. Excuse me. Good afternoon, Rick Malecki from Team Global LLC. Uh, thank you very much for taking time to, uh, to share this with us. Uh, question, I know there's nothing we can do about the past except learn from it, but as far as your lessons learned and new processes, I hear that there's, you've got better standards and things like that. Something that came to my mind as, I, as you're talking, it seems like there's a great opportunity for designed FEMAs and or process FEMAs that would have helped that. May not have eliminated that problem originally, but if I, in fact, if I look at the two plants, the one that, that you had the problem with and the one that you didn't have the problem with, things like a design FEMA would have helped find that. You would have said that the plant that you didn't have it, the, you had ways of or understanding what was going on, you're monitoring that. The other plant, you didn't. You had the, uh, the generators were down below lower, so they were, were not effective or able. You didn't have the uh, ability to monitor that as well. But design FEMAs help expose those things very readily, and it's, it's getting the right people together, part by part, system, subsystem by subsystem, system by system, and putting together design FEMA and fixing those problems when it's in the, the dry eraser mode, not after you've cut steel and, and plant piers in the ground or whatever. So just the question is, at a high level, do you, do you have something that's the equivalent of design FEMA in your new yeah, process? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, they have basically a regulatory process that they look at those activities. I think what Japan, as they move forward, will look at something similar to that, but I think small modular reactors are a, a concept that would probably uh, enhance their safety and look at design beyond design basis accidents. Because what happened at, at 1F, it was way beyond a design basis accident with a 50-foot tsunami wall. At Dine, it was a little bit different. They didn't lose that offsite power. So I, I think it would have been hard to analyze it at the level that you wanted to. They're going to they're gonna look at, at a lot more margins now of safety. They'll look at beyond design basis. But I think as they move forward for clean energy, uh, some small modular reactors may be more adaptable. So, so we, so, Lake, uh, question for you uh, on that uh, that idea, this beyond design basis. Do you, I'm sorry, do, did you have, I, get, we, we got to press on, we have run out of time, sorry. The, um, feel free to uh, reach out to them after. The 9-11 the event uh, was significant for the U.S. nuclear fleet. Uh, one of those planes flew right over Indian Point, and a lot of people started thinking beyond design basis in this country. Uh, if... The uh, events of March 11th, earthquake and tsunami, had occurred to a similarly situated plant in this country. Given what happened on 9-11 and the, the effort to go beyond design basis as a result of that, would there have been meltdowns? No one knows for sure. In my personal opinion, they would not have. Uh, and it ties back into the gentleman's question about the design basis. Uh, the original design basis for Fukushima Daiichi was three meters. You know, basically nine feet tsunami, that was the best thinking in the 60s and early 70s when that was designed. It ended up with 15 meters, not at all what they expected. The plant elevation was at 10 meters. 
So people thought there was plenty of margin for several decades uh, on the plant. Uh, and you know, this is a generation two plant, so it needs pumps and things. Um, now what happened, so they had a big tsunami, they lost everything pretty much, and they were blind, and we had the meltdowns. In the case, uh, when the planes flew over Indian Point in America, we looked at that and said, started thinking about the unthinkable. What if the control rooms are lost? What if you know, we'd, we'd lost basically Indian Point on this thing? And then in America, we spent billions of dollars, and RC oversaw this, and the industry implemented it, to basically improve to that we could basically cool the cores under unthinkable situations. So we practiced a lot more on the venting and, and these things. Now, if, if the Japanese looked at this and said, we're not going to have a terrorist attack, which is the only thing we could think of that could possibly get us into that situation. Uh, wasn't the, the failure effects and all. And so, but we practiced the unthinkable. And that would have, I think, allowed us, in my opinion, if this had been an American plant, uh, our, our team, our operators were more practiced to deal with these unthinkable events. And we probably could have prevented the core melts uh, that the Japanese were not, not capable of doing. But we had invested multi-billion dollars for designing and, and operating under unthinkable situations. Uh, but no one ever would have thought it was a tsunami. We all thought it would probably be a terrorist event of some sort. All right, question back here. Yeah, uh, the failure in um, Japan seemed to be attributed a lot to a failure of the backup system. You had no backup power. Has uh, the standards of how backup power is provided at nuclear plants changed in Japan? And maybe has that changed in the US because of this uh, disaster? I'd say yes and yes. I mean, the Japanese, the, the new regulatory authority in Japan is extremely conservative, okay? Um, I would almost say excessively so, but the pendulum swings from being a little too open to very, very restrictive. Uh, so yes, they've extreme high. They were looking at even higher tsunami design basis at, at the Fukushima area. That's one of the reasons why the investment to, to restart them is, isn't feasible from a management point of view. America, we did the same. A lot of the NRC put orders out, and so there was a lot of look-see of, of extending that. So yes, the standards were changed for, to, to avoid the, the beyond station blackout we, power. Let me give you some examples. Uh, Miles had talked about Kashiwazaki Kariwa. At that site, they now have a massive number of portable generators that in case they have a station blackout, they have a lot more uh, backup portable systems. They also have a, a basically a natural gas system that can fire up. And then in the event that they had a loss of gravity accident, they even have a, a lake that they built up above the KK plant, and they have water that can flow down and always keep the, the uh, core covered under with no pumps, with no electricity at all. So at KK, I think they've gone way beyond what we would have done in the United States. And, and as Lake indicated, after 9-11, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the utilities both worked together to address station blackout. They did look at all the causes that could result in a station blackout, but they said, if we have one, we can handle it. All right, we have another question back here. Hi, so a lot of the talk about, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Josh, uh, sophomore in uh, environmental engineering. I, so a lot of the talk about nuclear power of the future is pertaining to safety and all these new fail safes that we have, and we've covered that pretty well in this, over this, but also there's talk of new technology. There are many issues with uh, current uranium technology, such as uh, pollution of the environment with the mining and the waste and such, uh, but there's also research into things like thorium reactors. China, for one, has been researching thorium reactors, and it's not often you get three nuclear experts in one room. What do you have to say about thorium reactors and the other fissile material and their viability? You know, thorium reactors have been looked at for a long, long time. And um, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, we have a lot of uranium resources. And uh, when you think about the mining, don't forget that solar and, and wind also have a lot of mining associated with that technology. So. There's no perfect source of electricity. You have to do trade-offs and you have to do balances. But thorium has been a, a project and a 
uh, reactor concepts that's been around for a long time. We just know a lot more about uranium. You know, we know a lot more about how to do it. Uh, probably the world's leader in thorium right now is still India. You know, they have a, a massive program because they did not have a lot of natural uranium uh, to do the mining. So they've done a lot of work on thorium. But it, I'm not sure there's a magic bullet with thorium. Just because it's abundant doesn't mean that it's better. Question here. Hi, I'm Sydney. I'm a student here in nuclear engineering. As the next generation continues into the nuclear field, what can we do to change the culture around nuclear energy and make it so that we can continue to give an environmentally sound solution to the energy crisis when everyone has very negative connotations around nuclear energy? Great well, question. Mm. Good question. I, I'll, I'll start it on that. Um, I, I think informing people, okay, on what the facts are, what the scientific facts are, uh, how we've learned, okay, and there is no, there is no free lunch. You don't, you know, we all wish we could have magical electricity out of the wall that did nothing. But you have to balance these out, but you have to do it safely and in an environmentally protective way. And I think nuclear is, is, is a good option, part of the one of the above. And we need, we need them all. And Japan especially, I think, is going to need it because of their physical location and the way they are. I, I think it was commented earlier, um, you're part of the younger generation that embraces technology a lot more than uh, people like Sinai's age. Uh, and so I think inherently, um, I think young people are supportive of high technology, creative, efficient, safe environment, all those kinds of things. Uh, and as Lake indicated, I think we just need to better communicate it and, and talk about it. Uh, I picked uh, nuclear to go into because of its environmental characteristics. I grew up on a farm, and electricity revolutionized our lifestyle. And I looked at, do I want to be a part of that electrical sector, and nuclear is, one of, I think, one of the more environmentally sound ways to generate electricity. I think we just need to communicate that in a better way. But I do believe that your generation is uh, more embracing, probably, of nuclear than uh, uh, Lake and I. And I think in Japan, it's probably the same way. I think young people, uh, in general, are not afraid of, of, of new technology. Yeah, one thing that uh, um, I dare to say that uh, the good side of this accident is that people realize uh, the options, and then we seriously start discussing that. And then we have a lot of opportunities for us to explain the importance of nuclear. And then particularly younger people are listening and then understand that, which is very, very hopeful for me. But the older generation is very, very <laughs> stubborn and then very, very history, historical. But, uh, um, if I, if, if Japan, in Japan, if we ask that the kind of questionnaire to the older people, do you like nuclear? Uh, Miles said that, to me, I would say 68, 70% people said, I don't like nuclear. But if you change the question, when you think about the future of the en energy of Japan, what, do you think that nu nuclear is necessary or so something like that? The more than 50% people said yes. So it's so better discuss, better, you know, as I said, it, uh, keep the interest in, in energy situation or energy technology or whatever. So that, uh, of course, education is very, very important. What better way to end a panel at a university than saying education is important? <laughs> well done. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow we're going to do, and this is uh, day two, and we finished day two, we're going to do a look at medicine and health. And we're going to look at safety and security uh, in the morning and afternoon. Then uh, later in the day, we will have a um, round, uh, kind of a fireside chat with Senator Mike Braun and William Bookus of the NNSA to talk about America's role in a nuclear world, issues of nonproliferation, et cetera. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with some conference takeaways. Uh, Jackie Kemper will join me in uh, debriefing Leslie Dewan on her take on all that. She is, after all, part of that new generation. I want to thank our panel. Uh, you guys are great, in particular Naomi Hirose, okay. who flew 
12 hours from Tokyo to be here and then drove and then went to the wrong Fowler. And here he is. <laughs> and you this, did a great job. Is, Thank you for is, sharing your story and communicating this, it so this well. This is uh, 7 o'clock uh, in, the, in the morning, Tokyo time, <laughs> Thursday, Thursday morning. I left Tokyo Wednesday morning, early in the morning. It's been uh, 30 hours. So I, 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 I've come to... I've come to, I've come Indiana to have a communication with you. So it's, it's a very good opportunity. Well, I, thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I guess you could say, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Well done, sir. Well done. cry out in the night as they grow restless longing for some solitary company.